every major victory in war is a result of long planning, long preparation, with the loss of often thousands of men. But uh, when something comes along that is unexpected and you have this great prize, now there's a great alarm. In the other cases, you've expected it, you've planned for it. And uh, here, you come along with something that gives a great lift to the morale of the whole force, everybody. I think from private up to uh, uh, our bosses in Washington and London knew that the war was over. Every one of us realized that if Hitler had the slightest sense, he would immediately surrender. But it was a, the gallantry of the men that did it is something that should never be forgotten. And uh, uh, their names really ought to be in some, uh, uh, I'd say, permanent place in the niche of uh, fame that the American uh, uh, government should like to keep. People of Remagen love their bridge. They loved it because it was an attraction for visitors from all over the countryside. And they loved to stroll across it on Sunday afternoons to have picnics near the site of it. And they're right proud of the fact that the bridge was a strategic link between the German Ruhr on the north and the Saar Moselle region on the south. Everybody knew that it would take a long amount of planning to cross the Rhine River because this was the big natural barrier between the Siegfried Line and the straight shot toward Berlin. So even before we landed in Normandy, the Supreme Headquarters began to lay its strategic plans. To explain the strategy for crossing the Rhine, a little background is necessary. Uh, Hitler still had, at that time, a very uh, strong army and strong armed force west of the uh, Rhine. And uh, we counted on the, almost the certainty that he would not allow them to withdraw when, he saw, when they saw their uh, situation to be uh, hopeless and um, take the bulk of their forces back across the Rhine and therefore um, defend that uh, very great obstacle in such a way that we would have a very terrible time to get across. So um, we began to plan the basic, or what you might say the power crossing of the uh, Rhine for a crossing just to the north of the Ruhr. This would be in the, uh, in the uh, zone of the 21st Army Group under uh, General Montgomery and uh, to that force, I had attached the 9th Army under General Simpson to uh, reinforce uh, Montgomery's blow. Well, and of course, we, made, uh, we gave him a considerable time to prepare for that, uh, you might call formal or power crossing. In the meantime, however, we went about the business of destroying the German forces west of the Rhine, and this was a series of blows that had been um, taken up first in the way to the north and into Bat uh, Bradley's uh, army group and finally down into the uh, army group of Devers which had both a French army and an American army 
in his command. There was considerable argument as to how we should cross the Rhine when we reached the West Bank. The British argued, particularly Marshal Montgomery, that we should cross only in the north and make our attack north of the Ruhr toward Berlin. The maximum number of divisions you could supply on that narrow front was something like 25, but he wanted to take these divisions and let the rest of us stay on the west bank in a defensive position. The Americans argued that that was no way to do it, that we should advance on a broad front so that the Germans could not concentrate against us on a narrow front. And with a broad front, we'd have better mobility and uh, could uh, probe and secure the places where they were weakest. So that uh, my plan was to cross the first army just south of the Ruhr and the third army under Patton to cross down somewhere near Koblenz and then join them together and attack to sweep around the south and east side of the Ruhr and connect up with the 9th U.S. Division, which at that time was under Monty, uh, on the east side of the Ruhr and then clean up the Ruhr. As a matter of fact, we did do that later and secured something like 368,000 prisoners in the Ruhr. At the end of February 1945, the 9th Armored Division, having been re-equipped and received replacements, was moved up behind the, the first army and attached or assigned to the third corps and crossed the Royal River north of the dams. We then moved out onto the Rhine Plain where we encountered small pockets of resistance, which was primarily the, that of the anti-aircraft defense guns, which had been lowered so that they could fire as anti-tank guns. <laughs> Owing to the lack of cover and the very flat terrain, this, this was a very serious obstacle, but we were moving forward at the rate of five to 10 miles an hour. One of the reasons that the Americans made such great progress toward the Rhine was the fact that Hitler insisted that every position be held to the last man. This meant that the Americans could bypass a good many of these strong points which the Germans had set up in the Rhineland. There was great confusion in the German defenses at Remagen on March 7, 1945. Captain Friesenhahn, the engineer commander, had been sent to Remagen in 1943 to assume command. He was replaced by Captain Brodke as the top commander who came in 1944. These two commanders tried in vain to sort out the miscellaneous set of units that kept filtering through Remagen. As the, Americana, As the Americans approached Remagen in early March, I had at my disposal, in the bridgehead of Remagen, one sapper company of 125 men. The sappers were assigned to the planking of the railroad bridge in order to make it passable for motor vehicle traffic. The men had to work day and night in order to complete the bridge. Beside these men, the bridge defense company was also under my command. It consisted of 35 men, convalescents, all of whom were still under treatment. Some of these men were not even able to manipulate a gun because, of course, they had stiff limbs. 
The town of Remagen had some advantages for both the attacker and the defender. From the standpoint of the attacker, there was high ground going into the town where you could direct operations from. But it was very easy to defend Remagen because of the crooked and narrow streets and particularly the 600 foot high cliff on the opposite side of the Rhine which provided wonderful observation for 10 miles around from which the defender could see anybody approaching the town. On the morning of March 7th, we received orders and were given maps covering the area leading to Remagen. We noticed on the map the bridge of the Ludendorff Bridge. No one paid any attention to this bridge on the map because we had received no orders pertaining to the bridge or the capture of the bridge. All we were told was that we would attack the town of Remagen, take it, and then swing south, try, trying to connect up with Patton's Third Army. Progress was not too fast. It was just 10 miles to the Rhine, but it took considerable time to get there. We met up with some so-called light resistance, but I've always felt that a 30 caliber bullet aimed at the right spot is just as heavy resistance as an artillery shell if, if the man dies from it. Realizing that the Rhine was our mission, we looked forward with some anticipation, of course, of reaching this historical river. Some of us recognized that the Rhine itself had a great deal of impact on the outcome of the war, that it had to be crossed, but how it was to be done, uh, we were not advised. And it was hoped that when we did reach the Rhine, that we would be given a break, being an armored outfit, that uh, we would not be able to get across the Rhine until some type of bridging had been established. Early in March of 1945, there was a whole series of new company commanders in Company A of the 27th Armored Infantry Battalion, where Carl Timmerman served as a platoon leader. The advance along the Rhineland toward Remagen resulted in a number of casualties to the officers, and on the night of March the 6th, Carl Timmerman was tapped to be the next company commander of Company A. His orders were to capture the town of Remagen and then to stop. By the morning of the 7th of March, along about 11.30, Carl Timmerman saw a great deal of excitement up ahead on the edge of the woods. He gunned his jeep, went to the edge of the woods, and looked down on the broad Rhine River and there he saw the electrifying sight of a bridge still standing, the Ludendorff Bridge, a bridge which the Americans never expected to find standing. Around 1020 a.m., the entire front line of the American infantry had reached the edge of the Remagen Bridgehead. Our bridge defense company opened fire with rifles and machine guns upon which the American infantry forces retreated and for the time being everything remained quiet. About 11.15 a.m. a major in general staff uniform arrived and introduced himself as Major Schurler. Major Schurler told me that he had orders to take over command at Remagen. At that moment, I breathed a sigh of relief because I thought, now we will get the promised additional battalions. My first question was, where are the battalions? Major Schurler looked at me in surprise and asked, which battalions? Now it was my turn to look surprised, and I almost suspected that something was not quite in order. When Timmerman first saw that the Remagen Bridge was still standing, his first reaction was, let's get some artillery down on that, because look at all those German vehicles and troops that are crossing. 
However, the order came back from higher headquarters, nothing except air bursts would be fired at that bridge, since it's still standing. Timmerman was then ordered by Colonel Engelman, the task force commander, to make a reconnaissance down into Remagen, which he proceeded to do. The tanks and infantry then attacked the town. The infantry moved, hugging close to the walls of the buildings of the town, cleaned it out within two hours. While the troops were moving into position for the attack on the bridge, we captured a number of soldiers, civilians, and some railroad people in uniform. The rumor came back to me that several of these reported that the bridge was to be blown up at four o'clock. I don't think there was any truth in that, but at the time, I informed the task force commander, Colonel Engman, that he should speed up his attack since the bridge was supposed to be blown at 4 o'clock. It was then about 3.30. Major Devers, the infantry battalion commander, asked Lieutenant Timmerman, you think you could get your company across that bridge? Timmerman said, well, we could try. Devers said, go ahead. Timmerman asked, what if the bridge blows up in my face? The battalion commander didn't answer, he just walked away. In fact, nobody ever answered the question, what if the bridge blows up in my face? While these troops were taking their position on the west bank of the Rhine along the bridge, an explosion occurred in the causeway leading to the bridge. This threw up a great quantity of dirt and smoke, and afterwards I saw it, and it was about 30 feet in diameter, and formed an obstacle to the crossing of vehicles. A powerful detonation occurred on the left bank of the Rhine, immediately behind the bridge. I did not know how to explain this. Captain Friesenhahn, the bridge commander, had blasted the dike on the other side of the bridge, at the ramp of the bridge, a demolition which had already been envisaged. This was a sign to me that the Americans were approaching. But so far as the, the main demolitions were concerned, something very peculiar happened on the morning of the 7th of March. Friesenhahn and Brodka had ordered some reserve TNT in order to arm the explosives. When the truck came up on the morning of the 7th of March, Brodka and Friesenhahn were horrified to discover that they had gotten just about half as much explosives as they had been promised. And in addition to that, it was an industrial type of explosive known as Donorit instead of the military explosives, which was far more powerful. Captain Friesenhahn was calling from the tunnel entrance. Captain Bratke, Captain Bratke, combat commander! I rushed over to him. Still completely out of breath, he reports to me, the Americans, they are the Bishop Timber men. This mill was located immediately behind the Rhine. In other words, they had reached the bridge. I told him, Friesenhahn, bless the bridge, blow it up! I, I, I have no permission. Major Schurler is the only one who can give the order for demolition. At that moment, Major Schurler was on the other side of the tunnel, 350 meters away from us, only to be reached on foot. So I dashed off through the dark tunnel to Major Schurler. I reported to him, the Americans are going to cross the bridge. Major Schurler is very calm. I said, Major, 
Come if you don't give orders to blast the bridge, I will do so. Then go ahead. Have the bridge blasted. I ran back to Captain Friesner. Back again through the dark tunnel. Again, minutes passed before I could reach him. As soon as he could hear me, I called out to him. Friesenhahn, blow up the bridge! Friesenhahn shouts. Full cover! Full cover! Everybody in the tunnel lies down flat on the ground in order to escape the tremendous blast we expected. As far as we know, we actually saw the bridge lift up off its foundation. There was dust and debris thrown all over, and after a while, you couldn't see the bridge anymore. Uh, it wasn't too long. The dust cleared. The bridge was still standing. And Timmerman said, OK, move out. Instinctively, my hand comes to my neck. I know. If the bridge doesn't go down into the water, my life will be at stake. Something has to happen. I rush back to Major Schurler and report to him. Demolition of the bridge has failed. But I had hardly reached him when someone called again through the tunnel. Captain Bradke, come back, Commander, up front. It grows louder and louder. Major Schurler says, have a look what is going on. Again, I run back through the tunnel, through the masses of civilians, passing men, women, children. Soldiers are amongst them. I reach Friesen. Friesenhahn already shouts, Americans across the bridge. That was all we needed. Come on, Friesenhahn. A few men from the Sapper unit. Counterattack. There can't be many of them. We have to throw them back. But uh, I've already tried it. We wanted to get out immediately. But look, the tremendous gunfire aimed at the entrance of the tunnel. One grenade after another. You can't subject anybody to that. No one will get out alive. Friesenhand, there is only one possibility. Escape through the other end of the tunnel, across the dam, a counterattack. The Americans have to retreat. I rush back to Major Schurler. Report to him. Americans are crossing the bridge. Major, you have to prepare for an immediate counterattack. I will get the people out of the tunnel. Do you want to get them out? No, Bradka. You go ahead. I enter the tunnel. Get hold of a sergeant. Summon everyone who still carries arms. Here, one, two, three, four, nine men. Sergeant Fulner. Run along and get me nine men. Major Scheller still has two lieutenants with him. He should put them into action. In the meantime, I look for some more men. Sergeant Fernal leaves. I shout, get them together. I have five men now. Fernal comes back. Major Scheller isn't there. It's impossible, I think, myself. And I even barked at Sergeant Fernal in a rather irritated manner. Open your eyes! He is standing right there at the entrance to the tunnel. He is aggravated and replies, that isn't so. He's gone. What to do now? I accompany him to the entrance of the tunnel. Major Schurler is gone. He left the tunnel together with the two lieutenants in the direction of Funke. That was the last thing I could make out. Immediately, I, I make an announcement. I am taking over. Combat command at once. I run back to Friesenhahn. He will have to know what is going on. I tell him, Friesenhahn Schurler is gone. I don't know why he left. Now we have to get all the men who are still in here out of the tunnel, gather everyone near Ostberg and launch a counterattack. There is no other alternative left. Friesenhahn agrees. Friesenhahn and I push all the men from the back to the front in order to evacuate the whole tunnel. The first soldiers leave the tunnel. Hand grenades burst straight in front of them. Gunfire, machine gun fire hits the tunnel entrance. And the Americans have crossed the mountain terrain. They have the tunnel exit. How that was possible, I still can't understand up to this day. How many times did I climb this mountain, what an effort it was. That was not only a good military achievement, but also a commendable physical accomplishment of our comrades on the other side. 
Now, unknown to the German commander, Captain Brodke, on the afternoon of March 6, the day before the Americans reached Remagen, this anti-aircraft unit was replaced and sent down to Koblenz. The unit that came in to take its place never did get up to the top of the hill on the 7th of March. Since the Bear Bridge was standing, I directed the task force commander to move the infantry across the bridge. While watching their progress over the bridge, I received a radio message from the division stating that previous missions were canceled and that Combat Command B was to move south across the Ara River in the direction of Koblenz and join up with the units of the 3rd Army which were moving north from that direction. I did not know how, exactly how to react to this since we were in process of capturing a bridge over the Rhine, which I believe to be of considerable value to our forces. On the other hand, it was a direct violation of orders not to call off this attack and proceed to the south. There seemed to be one way of getting out of this dilemma, and that was for the bridge to fall. So I stood on the hill and watched the bridge until the infantry battalion had reached the far bank. My next thought was that I should get back and contact higher headquarters and tell them what the situation was, that I had disobeyed their orders, and receive confirmation for the action which I had taken. When I received this uh, phone call from Hodges, uh, it was one of the best pieces of news we'd received for some time. It was a great satisfaction that we had been able to capture this bridge, and I expect I was somewhat excited about it. And um, I, as soon as I finished talking to Hodges, I called Eisenhower. He was very excited about it, and uh, we both realized this is very fine news. It would save us the trouble and expense and casualties of making an assault crossing of the Rhine, and it really was uh, one of the nicest things that happened to us during this period. Well, I shouted with glee, of course, and I told uh, Bradley, well, look, um, we were going to uh, capture Cologne with uh, an allotted uh, four or five divisions to that, and uh, Cologne surrendered. Uh, you've got those right handy. They are not allo allotted now to any other mission. Why not get them across? Well, he said, that is exactly my plan, but I just wanted to check in with you. And I said, all right, we agree. You get over there just fast as you can. And uh, they did this, uh, I forget the name, the numerical designation of the Corps, but they went over very rapidly. 